So this is our last problem in 10.8. We're going to finish it right now. So we did the uh, antiderivative at x to the n is right there down below. I'm just going to copy everything else down. All right, and this is ln of 1 minus x. How in the world can I figure out c? So we're almost done. I just need to figure out what value goes right in there. So this is supposed to be true. I could do a uh, interval of convergence, but what x values is guaranteed to converge for without doing any tests, nothing? Zero. zero. So it better converge for zero. S is it OK to plug in the zero, zero into this? Is that defined? What's ln of 1? So ln of 1 will be 0. So I'm going to, I want to find c by plugging in an x value in the interval of convergence. Without, I could compute the interval, but no matter what, 0 is going to be in there. So let's just go ahead and drop in 0. So I'm going to use x equals 0, which is in the interval of convergence. <coughs> All right, ln of 1 minus 0. That's ln of 1, and ln of 1 is 0. Now on the right side, we got minus c minus summation. So when x is 0, all these terms are 0. What about the initial term? What is the initial term going to be? It would be 0 to the first power, not 0 to the 0 power. So every term will be 0. What is infinite number of zeros added together? 0. So I just get negative c minus 0. 0 equals negative c, so c equals 0. And I have the final result, which is just basically erase the c right there. So I have ln 1 minus x equals, to properly write it as a sum, this negative sign was hanging out, out front. What I'm going to do is put it inside the summation. So it looks like positive summation, not negative summation. So it's going to be negative x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, equals 0 to infinity. So there we go, power series for this natural log. All right, any questions on finding C? Or the other steps we took in this problem before that? Did you just set C equal to zero? I didn't set C equal to zero. I, I chose that right there. It should be true for this line above this equation at the very top should be true for all x in the interval of convergence. The interval of convergence of this is definitely not negative infinity to positive infinity. I think it's probably negative 1 to positive 1, and you have to check the endpoints. But the interval is not everything. And I could choose any x inside that interval. So if I wanted to choose a not 0 for x, I'd have to find the interval, make sure it's in the interval. You and zero always works. Zero always works, I di and this summation is zero when I plug zero in, so why make things difficult? Like, let's say a half is in there. Well, first of all, that's going to be an ugly number if I plug a half in. It's ln of a half, some negative number. And then I have to figure out what in the world is this summation of a bunch of halves to powers, which I don't think we have a good formula for that. So I just chose the easy x value. So I actually thought of one more problem we'll do right here. Find power series four. <clears throat> one plus x squared. How in the world can we use that last result <laughs> to find this?
What changed? So we went from minus x. I'll rewrite this. Gesundheit. What is f of x in this case right here? It's almost x squared. Negative x squared. Negative x squared. So all I have to do is look up in this formula up here. I'm going to replace x by this new f of x right here. Now I'm just going to substitute in the actual f of x that I just wrote down. And last up, <coughs> this is not quite in a normal power series form. What I'm going to do is write it as negative 1 times x squared to the n plus 1. And then I'm going to distribute the powers because we're multiplying. And that's x to the 2n plus 2 because it's 2 times n plus 1. So I just went ahead and distributed that power. Well, I'm going to write one more simplified step below. Or did I? What did I do? So I basically said, oh, there's another negative one hanging out out front. And so I multiplied it in there. It's technically n plus 2, but because it's just positive 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, you can take 2 away and not, uh, not change it. <laughs> I didn't notice. <laughs> Will the sneeze show up? <laughs> so that's our last problem in 10.7. We're going to jump into 10.8 now. So what we're going to do in 10.8 is construct a power series from the original function without knowing some very similar power series. So we did in this, on these problems, we knew uh, a very similar power series, and then we took a derivative or antiderivative and turned it into, very carefully, our function. So we're going to do in the next section is what's called a Taylor series, where we skip this intermediate step. We go right from the function to the power series. Of course, there is quite a bit of work you have to do to go from one to the other. So let's, let's say you already have a power series somehow magically for this function. So let's say you already know a, a function has a power series representation. 
how in the world could I figure out what A0 is? So let's think about what this looks like. It's going to be A0 times x minus a to the 0 plus a1 times x minus a to the first plus a2 x minus a squared plus etc 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 how can I figure out a0 how can I make all the rest of the terms disappear you can use any x value you want. Set x equal to a. Set x equal to a, that will eliminate every term that has an x minus a in it. All right, so we set x equal to a. On the left side, we have f of a equals, <clears throat> I'm going to skip that summation form and just go to the right side, equals a0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0. And of course, f of a mean, uh, is a0. All right, so that's how we get a0. Any questions on that? That required no calculus. It's pretty much just algebra right there. How in the world can I figure out A1? This is quite a bit harder. So you don't even need to know A0 to get A1. How in the world, how do I get rid of x minus A without setting x equal to A? What's another operation? Without what? Without setting x equal to A. Divide by x minus A. Could try to divide by x minus A, but then I have to divide both sides by x minus A. Like this side would have to go divided by x minus a. What calculus move gets rid of x minus a? Take a derivative. <laughs> so <laughs> let's take a derivative. <coughs> All right. F prime of x equals, I'm going to jump to the right side. What's the derivative of a0? Zero. zero. What's the derivative of the second term? A1. A1. What's the derivative of the third term? Two, two. Let's put a third, I'll write the third term down because that should hopefully be enough. We can see the pattern of why this is going to work. So I'm going to write the, what's the derivative of that third term there? 3a uh, subscript 2 parenthesis x minus a parenthesis uh, superscript uh, over script 2. Squared. Too much entering into web work. <laughs> 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 carrot 2, carrot 3. <laughs> All right, so there's a derivative right there. How do I get a1 now, now that you see this form? Set x equal to a. So we get f prime of a equals 0 plus a1. What are all the rest of the terms? Zero. Yeah. Plus zero, plus zero, plus zero. So let's just shortcut it, just stop right here. All right, f prime of a equals a1. All right, next up, let's find a2. So we need to take a second derivative. Yeah, if things work, let's take another derivative. F double prime of a equals a. Well, <clears throat> remember, we don't want to plug in a until after we take our derivative, or else we're going to have some problems. So. It would be dangerous to just jump right to f double prime of a, trying to take a derivative and plug in the value at the same time. That's too much. The order is important. So we got 0. a1 turns into 0. 
we got 2a2 plus, what's the next term? What's the a3 term? 6a2 parenthesis x minus a parenthesis. So we got 6a3 x minus a to the first power. I'm going to rewrite 6 as a factorial. What factorial is 6? 3 factorial. What factorial is 2? 2 factorial. There is a reason I'm doing this. Think about taking uh, higher order derivatives. So if there was an n, uh, n power, I'd take n derivatives, and I would get n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3. So this factorial pattern shows up here. This is probably the least number of terms to see it pretty clearly happening. The next one would have been, uh, let's see, well, almost 4 factorial. All right, how do I get a2 now? You said x equals a. Yep, so same thing. So you go to a, so f double prime a equals 2 factorial a2 plus everything else is 0. So I'm not going to write it. And we have to do a tiniest bit of algebra. a2 equals f double prime of a over 2 factorial. So questions on this right here. Can we create a new series? Yes, yeah, so we are going to create a new series. <coughs> we started off pretending that, or I should say supposing, that's the grown-up language we use for pretending, uh, <laughs> that we had a power series. You said, if it existed, what would it look like? Okay, which is a very powerful tool to use. Uh, if something existed, what would the implications be? So we assumed it existed, and then what, uh, what could we derive from that form? All right, let's rewrite. <coughs> I want everything to appear in this uh, prime divided by factorial. So I'm going to write the parenthesized derivative notation where I'm about to go to derivative 3, derivative 4. So I don't want to go prime, 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 prime. So I'm just going to write 2 for derivative. All right, I want you to take an educated guess at what you think a3 would equal. The third derivative, the third a, dri so third derivative at a divided by what? Uh, three, factorial. three factorial. Are you putting in parentheses like that means that you're taking a uh, third derivative? Yeah. Instead of two. Yep, so notation f with a parenthesized number, whether it's x or a here, doesn't matter. This is n derivatives. Of x. So that's why we don't use the prime, prime, prime notation. At some point, it's silly. No. <laughs> I'm sure they were useful for a while, but they're not terribly useful now. All right, so let's go back. Let's see if this pattern holds. So I'm just going to write the pattern out. A0 equals uh, f. Now the zero derivative means take zero derivatives, or don't take a derivative. So when you say zero derivative, that means the function itself. What is zero factorial? Zero, zero. Almost. One. Let me one. So this is the same as f no derivatives at a over 1. So in the pattern, a1 is first derivative of f at a divided by 1 factorial. 1 factorial is 1. So this is just f prime a over 1. That's the same thing we got for a1. And then a2, we already see that pattern happening right there. For a2, I already wrote it. And a3 follows the exact same pattern. So I'll write down the uh, summary of all this.
So there's our power series, and the an term is just the nth derivative of f, plug in a, divided by n factorial. You could write it a slightly different way. So I can write that derivative right into the power series. If you write it into the power series, you have to divide by that factorial. All that really happened here, what I just put that blue box around, equals an right there. So I just rewrote it with that derivative right inside the power series already. So this this term right here is the an term. Is that a D out there in It's whatever letters make alternatively. I don't think there's a D in the word. It's a T. All right, so that's the one I recommend you put on your cheat sheet. You can absolutely put the one above it on your cheat sheet, but you don't need both. They have the exact same information. So this is called the Taylor series. of f centered at a. So when would we have problems, now that you know what the Taylor series looks like, when would we have problems with this not working out? What type of functions would not have a Taylor series? Can you take a derivative of every function? So any functions you can't take a derivative of won't have a Taylor series. So the function has to be differentiable, not just once or twice, but infinitely differentiable. You have to be able to take an arbitrary number of derivatives, not just 5 or 10, but an infinite number. So f has a Taylor series exactly when not just there has to not just be n derivatives but at a each derivative has to exist and be defined so the nth derivative is exists and is defined for all positive integers n so it's got to be exists for zero it almost unless you your function is not so fine, you'll always get the zero derivative. And notation so let t of f, t a of f be the Taylor series. of f centered at a. Now I have to be a little bit careful. <coughs> this is only going to be equal. This Taylor series is going to be equal to the original function uh, when x is in the interval of convergence. Oh, this is the positive integers. Be 0, 1, 2, etc. to infinity. So what I'm going to skip in this section is finding interval of convergence. That basically was the name of the last section was 
pretty much find interval of convergence for power series. We did a little bit at the end where we took derivatives and changed things around a little bit. So I'm not going to worry about computing the interval of convergence in this section. That was almost everything we did in 10.7, so your quiz is definitely going to be compute an interval of convergence. So let's go ahead and compute some actual Taylor series now. What would be a bad a value to center at for this uh, function? Zero. zero. So zero is bad because I don't even know f of zero is undefined. So my initial term doesn't even exist. So there's no way that series is going to make any sense. So zero would be a really bad number. Uh, any number that's not zero works. So let's go with something reasonable like two. So I'm going to center this guy at two right here. So first thing you want to do is find the pattern for the nth derivative. So you need to take enough derivatives, and don't worry about plugging in a yet. I just want to know what does the nth derivative pattern look like. The way you find that, we're going to start by finding, I already know f0 of a. I am going to do some calculus, so let's go ahead and write it x to negative 1. So first derivative. Second derivative, third derivative. What is the derivative of x to the negative 1? So it'll be negative x to the what power? Negative 2. So write down the second derivative and the third derivative. I recommend you leave your products written out. Don't multiply things together. So don't simplify when you do these. So your next one will be negative 1 times negative 2, x to the negative 3. So don't just write that negative 1 times negative 2 is regular 2. Leave it as a product. And go to the fourth derivative. I need a brave student to tell me either the entire nth derivative or part of the nth derivative. The negative, uh, what is it called? It's the other <laughs> f word. <laughs> factorial. It's almost factor. <laughs> so there's negative. a factorial. Negative factorial. Well, you need to be careful. Two. There really is no negative factorial. So there's a regular factorial. What's happening to the signs? They're alternating. So the 0 term is positive, the 2 term is positive, the 4 term is positive. So the signs are alternating. So the way we accomplish alternating is either negative 1 to the n or negative 1 to the n plus 1, depending on which, if we want to start positive or negative. Should this be negative 1 to the n or n plus 1? n plus 1. So let's make the first term correct. So would this n plus 1 work to give me the positive on the first term? Nope. So I like guess and check is a pretty good way to go about things. So just guess, maybe it's n plus 1, check it. No, it's not. It's just regular n. What do you check? Like, how do you check it? Do you check so this term is positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. It's alternating signs because I keep multiplying by another negative. So half the time it's positive, half the time it's negative. I just had to figure out, is the initial term positive or negative? And does that mean n or n plus 1, basically? So the plus 1 will make it 
positive? It would switch the sign, so the first term would be negative. It would go negative, uh, negative, positive, negative, positive. I want to go positive, negative, not negative, positive. Okay, so by adding one, you will make it negative. I yeah, exactly. My initial term would be negative. All right, let's take care of the x's. That's an easy pattern. x to what power? It'll be n minus, oh, we gotta be careful. Should be negative n minus one. But you could write as negative parentheses n plus one as well. You subtract the one from both terms, then? Take a derivative of that, isn't that what you're doing? I'm trying to write a, a what's called a closed form or a formula for the nth derivative. And I took enough derivatives that I can start to see the pattern, and I'm just trying to write form the pattern now. So I got an alternating sign that I just took care of. Now I'm looking at powers of x. So if I plug in 0 for n, I get the correct negative first power. If I plug in 1 for n, I get minus 1 minus 1, which is the minus 2 power, etc, etc. So I just took care of the x. All right, what else are we missing? n factorial. So we got an n factorial. Yes, we do times an n factorial. I'm going to reorder it. All right, so we know the nth derivative as part of this. Next, <coughs> let's look back and see what else we need. So this is, we don't actually need fn of a. We need fn of a, not fn of x. So first thing I'm going to do is plug in an a. You want to make sure you know what your derivative looks like before you plug a in. What would I get if I plugged a in first and then start taking derivatives? What do you always get if you plug your value in and then take derivatives? Zero. You always get zeros. So it's important to figure out the full pattern before you plug in A. So you want to basically finish all your calculus before you plug in A. So I need to plug in A, which for our case is 2. And then uh, basically, once I know Fn of 2, I can write this formula out. So that's all I really need to do here. Exactly right, yeah. So that's our a. I don't think I wrote it down, but in this case, our a is 2. It's that value center at. Let's write this as a fraction. All right, so we have our coefficient. I'm going to write out the full Taylor series. So this function was the 1 over x function centered at 2. Summation fn at a, x minus a to the n over n factorial. So I just copied this down from above what was in the box that we wrote down. The only piece I know is this fn of a right there. So I'm just going to take that fn of, oops, and a is 2, so I might as well plug in 2 wherever I see an a.
Yep, absolutely. So in factorial's out. This should look like a lot of other power series you've seen in the last section. So you could compute the interval of convergence, check the two endpoints. But we did enough of those problems already, they take a really long time. So you can check the interval of convergence on your own. This is 1 over x when x is in the interval of convergence. How do I know the radius is no bigger than 2? What x value would definitely not work here? We said red, two. If the 2 works. Three. What x value would definitely not work on the left side? 0, zero is not going to work on the left side. So <coughs> two, uh, 0 is not going to work. So no matter what, the radius can be no more than 2. Because I, you just think of the number line, I'm centered at 2. Zero is not allowed, so the radius can be no bigger than two. I believe this radius is two exactly, and zero is not in the interval. Four may or may not be in the interval, you have to check. So zero's out, four, you have to check. So on these kind of problems, when do you know to stop like, because we did the, like the prime thing, plug that in, maybe to this, so at that point, you just kind of get to you have to get the nth derivative formula at a. However many derivatives that takes to get there is how many it takes. Sometimes you will, you will figure it out in two derivatives. Sometimes it might take seven derivatives if things are strange. Um, and then you have to plug in the value and then that pattern may be slightly different as well. So you basically need to figure out the fn of a is what you need to do. The rest is just writing copying down the rest of it. That it? That's it for that problem, yep. So that's our 1 over x equals this when you're in the interval of convergence. If you're outside the interval of convergence, they are not going to be equal. So if you have an nth degree Taylor polynomial, uh, you, if you just say Taylor polynomial, that implies you're going to infinity. If you just say nth degree, that means you know, 15th degree, then I'm just going to the 15th power term and throwing away the rest. So this is the Taylor polynomial. Truncated. by throwing out terms of n plus one degree and higher. Erasing the last part of it. Okay. Is that a new word? Yep. Truncated. Does not mean to put in a trunk. I want you to find t0 of cosine of x. What does that mean about the a value we're centered at? 
it will be centered at zero. So cosine, pretty easy function to take derivatives of. You should be able to see the pattern pretty quickly. Remember, you're centering it at zero. So do a bunch of work represented by these dots. And at some point, you need to tell me uh, fn at zero, that pattern. So it's going to take some work before you can tell me the nth degree derivative evaluated at zero. So start out by finding uh, f prime, or first f zero derivative, then which is cos x. F first derivative, second, third, f four, f five. So five derivatives should be enough to see the pattern right there. So give me the five derivatives, and then plug in zero and write down that pattern. It's a good time to ask any questions you have. And the pattern for the sine or for the cosine function should be cyclic. It should repeat. derivative at the nth derivative at zero. A formula for that. At zero, not at two. We don't even know cosine and sine of two. So <laughs> we're going at that's why I chose zero. Pi over two or pi there's other reasonable choices, but I think zero is the easiest one that I could think of for this. Could done any reasonable multiple of pi. So after you do all those derivatives and you plug in zero to those axes. Yep.
there is a pattern. So half the terms are zero. The other half the terms are plus or minus one. So what we have is a piecewise function or a step function is what we have to write for all these terms. Unfortunately, there's not a very nice pattern. So <clears throat> I'll do my best to write out our step function here. So it's going to be three values, either 0. Let's go in order. We'll go negative 1, 0, 1. What type of n values would we get negative? All right, that's too difficult. What type of n values would we get? 0. So for all the sine ones, but for what types of n values? So all the odds, we have 0. So when n is odd, we get 0. So n is odd. What about negative 1? Can't just say even, because even could be 1 or negative 1. Be 2n plus 2. 2n. I think we have to go with 4. 4n plus, no. We could do this with uh, dividing by 4 and looking at a remainder. So if I did a computer science way, yeah. I could do n mod 4 <laughs> equals 1. But some of you won't be happy with that. That just means if I divide by 4, the remainder, if the remainder is 1 when I divide by 4. Uh-oh. No, that's not right. Okay. Never mind. 0. There we go. If the remainder is 0, when I divide by 4, oh, and that's not right either. <laughs> 2. There we go. <laughs> if we divide by 4 with the remainder 2, we have negative 1. And if we divide by 4 and our remainder is 0, we get positive 1. Where n mod 4 is uh, the remainder of n divided by 4. So there is a slightly different way to write this in a less computer science-y kind of way. Unfortunately, it's a lot longer. Usually writing things in math is a lot shorter, but this is one of the few exceptions. So here's the math way to write it out. If n is 4k plus 2 for some integer k, then you know it has remainder 2. And if n is 4k for an integer k, then it's divisible by 4. That's the math way to write that out.